Hello everybody, this is Simon here with Hofer College and Hofer Studios and uh, we're ready for another series of our studio talks and today I have the pleasure to meet a um, special guest, John Greenham, which is a mastering engineer well known for his work, not only for Billie Eilish but also many other artists and yeah. Um, I'm glad to see you and to have you joining this little party today so we can have a chat, talk about uh, your approach on mastering. Maybe you can share a little bit of your wisdom and of your technique and stuff that you use. And yeah, our people and students uh, in the live chat are also very welcome to join um, our little chat today. So maybe there are some, some questions that you can address and yeah, let's get this thing started. Um, I think it makes sense that we talk a little bit about uh, the role and importance of the mixing before the actual mastering as a first step, um, but also the mastering process and your approach in particular and uh, some very interesting topic, the loudness. Which role does it play in different formats like, let's say, vinyl or digital releases? So we can have the obvious chat regarding uh, the loudness and maybe mm. if the loudness war still exists and stuff like that. Well, do you want to start with the loudness? <laughs> no, I think <laughs> it's maybe something for the end. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, if you don't mind. Okay. Well, it, we, we asked about... Um, mixing which is of course part of the loudness thing and i think um <clears throat> uh having worked in like i started off working in san francisco which as you know is also in california it's a smaller city with a smaller music industry um i moved to la like 10 years ago and we're kind of loud here in la we're loud, you know, it's a, it's a loud place. Um, so uh, I'd say that um, as far as the mixing part of it goes, um, there's really kind of, you know, two different kinds of things that you're going to get. You're going to get uh, many of the mixers down here, like the, especially the well-known ones, are going to send you stuff that's pretty much finished. And basically what's happened in the chain of events is that the, uh, you know, there's a sort of original ref of the song that the producer is working from. Then the producer sends like a reference to the mixer, which is already really loud. And so the mixer then is sending references to the artist that are matching the level of the producer. And then you, the mastering engineer, get um, the mixes, which in some cases are, they just send the super loud one that the artist has been listening to. Mm -hmm. So um, there's not really a lot of decision making involved in mm -hmm. how loud it's going to be or looking at the meters or the luffs or anything like that. It's already, it's the way it is. That's the way people want it. Um, so in which case you're just kind of, in my case, my approach to that is just to kind of, um, you know, uh, run it through some nice analog gear. Recently, I've been using um, a pair of uh, Pultec uh, EQM 1S3 EQs, which is a pretty risky endeavor, actually, because, um, you know, they're not uh, transparent. Mm -hmm. And people always talk about mastering your step to stuff that's transparent. But the 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 Pultex are not transparent. They're very colored. They do a lot of things. Um, and it, it's actually quite surprising to me how much I can get away with putting them on people's music because it changes things quite radically. So um, sometimes I'll use those, um, which will give it a whole different um, texture. The thing about the Pultex is basically they make the vocals sound really good. That's their strength. So maybe the rest of the stuff gets a little kind of mushy, but the low end extension and the vocals will sound really good, which is, you know, that's the vocals are an important part of the music. So, but as far as the loud thing goes, yeah, I don't really, 
Honestly, uh, I'm not really, I don't really pay much attention to it. I'm, I'm just kind of trying to make it sound good. Mm-hmm. I'm not a big laughs guy, mm-hmm. you know. It's more the old fashioned way in some kind of style. So if you add some analog gear to add some flavor and some color to make yeah. it sound like um, you like it and yeah, yeah it's cool. Okay. Um, well, when it comes to mixing, um, do you have any criteria? Your mix, uh, the mix should actually uh, meet before the mastering. So, if you have a, a client or maybe let, let's say a mixing engineer um, that asks for your work, do you have some things that you tell them that you only do some masters if the mix are in this? particular file format or if there isn't much going on like um, a bus compression or something like that? You know, most of the people I work with are, you know, working at a pretty high level. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't say anything to them. In fact, a lot of times I'll I'll just get, you know, it's the person at the label, the A&R person or their manager, the artist manager that's sending me the stuff and they don't know anything about it. Um, <laughs> it's no good talking to them about it. <laughs> sure. You basically, you basically just um, do the best you can, you know. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, sometimes I do work with people who are, um, you know, they mix the project themselves or they're just starting out and they don't really know what they're doing. Um, and so there might be some back and forth there, and I might I might suggest some things, but usually not because, honestly, my feeling about it is that they they've really done the best they can at this point. They're sending it to mastering. They've sort of done the best they can, and if you start um, sort of, uh, you, you have to be very careful that you don't that people don't lose confidence in what they're doing. So if you if you start kind of loading them up with all these kind of things, then it sometimes kind of it'll destroy the feeling of what they're doing. There's you know there's this very well known thing in in music that actually, and this happens actually sometimes it happened the other day, that um, somebody will record a song and they'll send it to some well known mixer. Mm-hmm. And then they'll do their thing with it. And then, but the artist actually and the producer prefer the rough mix that they did because it's closer to the actual session. That was the feeling that they had when they were recording it. And that's kind of what they're going after, you know. So sometimes, um, you know, sometimes that happens. And so I think you have to respect, um, you know, people's feeling about the music they're doing. Mm And um, so, no, I don't often, um, I usually just do the best I can with what they've sent me. And sometimes um, you'll change it a lot, you know, get out the multi-band compressor and <laughs> you know, all this stuff. You, know. you, can, you can change a stereo mix a lot in mastering. So, um, you know, but yeah, I mean, you might say, well, look, the vocal's kind of buried, you know, can you send me one with the vocal up a bit or something like that? Mm-hmm. But um, it depends, you know, who you're working with. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times in the um, in the um, in the industry, there really isn't time to do any of that stuff. You just have to do the best you can because... Mm-hmm. The thing has a deadline and everyone else, you're the last person in the chain. Everyone else has used up all the time fiddling about with it and they send it to you and it has to be turned in tomorrow sure. or from today. Mm-hmm. It's window. So, you know, you there's no, there's not much you can do. So it's not that much about having revisions and um, getting, yeah, getting to, in touch. Yeah. No, that's right. You kind of, um, and that's really the, uh, I think that's the main skill in mastering. I think anybody can master a song if they take, you know, a week over it and keep going out and driving around in their car and listening to it and coming back and doing stuff and listening to it on this and listening to it on that and their phone and all that. But you kind of have to, sometimes you, you, I mean, the skill really is 
Yeah, maybe you kind of ease up on the creativity a bit if you've got to get it right. Maybe you don't do as much as you might if you had a bit more time because there isn't any time to do it again. So you don't want to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. So, but um, basically, you have to be able to get it right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, there's, there's, you know, yeah, you just have to do it correct. You'll aim for decisions and then you decide, okay, I'll go this way, maybe based on an analog setup or maybe a digital one or a hybrid thing. And finally, yeah. it has to work yeah. in the end and you can deliver what you did. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think that's the the key is to not get too adventurous. If it has mm -hmm. to be done right away, mm -hmm. there isn't any time for revisions. Don't start experimenting with mm -hmm. things that we've never done before. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's fact, yeah. Sorry, yeah, no, go ahead. Okay, I think it's uh, also an important thing when it comes um, to restore and recall what you did. If you have to go for a revision, so if you used your pull text or whatever, um, and you have to recall all the settings, that might be quite challenging because um, maybe you remember what you did uh, in this exact song or on this exact minute on the album or you don't and then you have to actually <laughs> improvise or something like that. So all this matters in the end. Well, I, have, um, I use a program called Trello, mm -hmm. which is um, sort of a project management software thing. Mm -hmm. And I take photographs of everything. And so the song is in there, you know, the, the photographs of the analog equipment, all of the settings are, are stored in there. So when I need to recall it, mm -hmm. I just go to them, you know, I can search for it, mm -hmm. and bring everything back the way it was. Okay. <clears throat> Except when I forget to yeah, take the sure. photograph. <laughs> And then, um, and then you just have to kind of, yeah, figure out what you do. You can sort of remember mm -hmm. roughly. You can get it pretty close. Yeah. So you aim for a proper uh, documentation when it comes to revisions that uh, you can offer the possibility. Well, again. it's very important. It's very important to do that because um, you're going to have probably they're going to in in you know sort of two months time they're going to send you instrumentals or they're going to send you TV mixes. And you need those need to be the same as the they need to be the same settings. So you need to keep a record of everything. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, we have quite a few questions going on in yeah, our yeah, YouTube cool. live chat. Let's start with the first one. Um, a guy or girl called Wiki. I think it's a girl. It's a, a woman. Um, she would like to know. Um, uh, she tells us that. Um, Till Forever Falls Apart is her favorite song at the moment and she wants to know um, if you remember something about the mastering that was going on with that song in particular on Till Forever Falls. If there's anything you yeah. remember, you can tell us a little story about it or something like that. So Till Forever Falls Apart. So Billie Eilish, right? Yeah. Is that what we're talking about? Uh, I'm sorry, I work on so many songs. I <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think when I did that, I was using um, my analog chain was just mm -hmm. the Elysia Alpha compressor and um, and uh, you know the um, Digital Audio Denmark AX12 that I that I used at that time, eight channel mm -hmm. uh, device. And the thing about the um, that particular, you know, you, you basically use different kind of, you have, I, in my career, I've had various different assemblages of equipment. And after about, I'd say, six months to a year, you start to get a sound out of it. This is a mastering thing. You know, it's like, I don't think it's a good idea in mastering, at least not for me, because I'm kind of slow. It takes me a long time to actually figure out on a sort of microscopic level, what's going on with a certain piece of gear. So when I did the Billy stuff, I had been using that that particular box for about five years. And the Digital Audio Denmark thing, you can you can actually hit it really hard. Mm -hmm. it, and it has kind of, um, it doesn't, well, it gets a bit crackly sometimes, as you can hear on the record, but it's like, 
um, but it's a big sound. Mm -hmm. It kind of sounds big, and it's kind of uh, it's kind of like saturation, but not really. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting sound, and I had that was my sound for about five years. Mm -hmm. So that's really um, what that is. And then there's um, the other things are um, the thing about Billy's stuff is that. Um, is that um, it's basically just she has this beautiful voice, mm -hmm. and that's really the whole thing. You know, the rest of it is like, and Phineas is a very intelligent chap, and he realized this. So, all of the other elements in the production are kind of dark sounding, there's nothing in the way of the vocal, it's just vocal and a lot of low end stuff mm -hmm. and a few little production things. So basically the voice is like, um, so I put like, you know, some saturation on, on the whole thing in a couple of places, I think. Um, and just, um, I don't know. I mean, my approach to it is just like, sometimes it's like you work on it until it starts to make you tear up. But it should, starts to make you cry. Mm -hmm. And then you know that you, that's when I'm kind of, no, it doesn't happen all, I don't spend all day, you know, in floods of tears over the stuff that I work on. But sometimes that'll happen when, I think when you've got the sort of thing correct. Um, you know, so I'm having a hard time remembering actually how that song goes, but um, I think it's one of the slower ones, right? I, th um, I think so, so, yeah. Yeah, you just focus on the voice and you make it as beautiful as you possibly can you know you just kind of try different things and mm -hmm. try and make it so that it's really um yeah engaging and mm -hmm. that's that's it but yeah you're very fortunate if you have a voice to work on that's like that yeah that doesn't happen you know sure so so really it's like it's not it's it's uh you know, we're only as good as the music we work on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's all about the artist, really. We're just kind of not screwing it up, you know, hopefully. Yeah. Just kind of, you know, yeah. Cool. Uh, when it comes to analog gear, well, you've been in the business for so many years and are quite used to working with analog stuff as the chain that you just described for, let's say, a Billie Eilish track. Um, Someone that's actually about to start with mastering, uh, do you have any recommendations um, uh, to to aim for when it comes to getting some analog gear to start right in um, when there's a decision yeah. that uh, in the box mastering is, is quite cool, but maybe I'll uh, I'll try to get some analog gear as well to implement yeah. it in my workflow? Any recommendations? Some yeah, gear? well, you know, unfortunately, you need that there's it, there's only a few things that when you pass the stereo signal through them, they're going to say it's going to make it sound better. Honestly, there's a lot of things that make it sound different. But um, so the first thing is D to A. Well, the first thing is the um, I use a, a like Windows 10 with an RME AES card, which I it feel like is the cleanest converter way. Well, it's the cleanest way to get the mm. digital signal out of the computer. Mm. To my way of thinking, I don't like the Macintosh thing. I don't. It doesn't really. I don't think it sounds as good. So. Uh, because Windows, you can you can configure like yeah, I have my computers are are um, custom built with all of the stuff that would slow them down gone. They're just audio computers. You can't do that with Macintosh computers, so that's why I don't I don't use them. So that's number one. Then you have the D to A, which is. Um, your D to A is going to work better with um, certain types of, it's gonna make the analog gear sound better, it's gonna make it work better. Different D to A's work better with different pieces of analog gear. Mm -hmm. yeah. They kind of, like the Pultex, for example, don't sound good 
with um, the Burl DJ. They sound really good with the uh, Lavery DJ the most of the time, the DAN5. But it's very, they're super clean and hi-fi. And they, so they need clean going into them. Otherwise, they're going to, it's really going to get muddy. Mm. Um, so the converters are, are really important because what you what, basically what you're trying to do is like every mastering engineer has a sound you know you're trying to develop a sound that's your sound and it, it you might think that it's a subtle distinction that everybody would sound similar but it's not if you send uh, a song to you know 10 different mastering engineers you'll get 10 different things back and they'll be quite different from one another and so in the end what it is it's it, it's an aesthetic it's your aesthetic it's how you want it to sound so what you need to do is you need to have things that um um that you so you can get the sound that you hear in your head well, a lot of these um a lot of the converters for example are or well, some of them are very clean sounding and neutral some of them are like that which i and i don't see the point in that because um <laughs> it sounds the same <laughs> okay i see some, some, some voodoo sounds. going on <laughs> yes. so it's like mm -hmm. um you know like for example the um well, I, maybe i shouldn't mention manufacturers i don't know but the uh, the merging stuff mm -hmm. is all very clean sounding to me and i tried out one of those boxes and it, it just didn't really do anything that I that I thought was different. You know, it's very it's very high quality mm -hmm. stuff. But it, and if that's what you want, that's fine. But I, for example, so then you've got the so you've got the DTA, you've got the analog stuff, which could be, you know, typically you have um, well I went from, you know I have a tube I have a pretty simple setup, but I have two uh, sort of tube EQs because I kind of like the 2B sound, even though it's a bit soft. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a solid state EQ, which is just, um, you know, which I use on the super loud stuff, because if you run super loud stuff that's very um, limited already through the tube stuff, it kind of <laughs> doesn't really work. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I wouldn't say that it can work, actually, but... Um, but it's difficult because the tube stuff's a bit unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So the solid state EQ is a better way to go sometimes. So, so you have that, you, those two options. I think the tube thing is interesting, but you've got to be careful with it. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be prepared to cut it loose if it's not working. And then you've got the solid state thing, and then you have maybe a little bit of compression. And then you've got the analog to digital thing, which is... Um, probably the most important part of the whole thing because um, there's a certain kind of thing right up at the top, you know, which you, you, because, you know, stuff has to be loud. I mean, it has, it's a loud world, you know, you can't be shy about, well, I work on pop music a lot. So it's like, mm. you, you, you know, it's got to knock, you know, it has to be like, so you have to push, you, you have to have something that you can push actually pretty hard because the, kind of the magic of the whole thing takes place in the last little half db or so when you bring it back to digital that's where the kind of whole thing kind of takes place mm -hmm. so um for me i use the lavery um the lavery stuff um the i forgot what it's called the savitar which is his dan lavery's new thing he just came out with which is an excellent sounding A to D, actually. It sounds beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it has um, some soft saturation options and so forth that you can, um, you know, it, it really is an interesting is an interesting thing. And that thing will give you a lot of, um, yeah, it'll give you a lot. Um, neutral, it's not. It's not neutral. Sure. Um, but better. It sounds better. And this is this is the I had this um, conversation with them. Um, you may know this mixing engineer called Tony Maserati, who's very 
accomplished fellow. And we were having lunch and he summed it up nicely. He said, when I send something to mastering, he goes, I just want it to come back. It's got to be better. So whether it's a little bit better or a lot better, I don't care as long as it's better. So that's the key to the whole thing. And so I think that um, if you're going to answer your question in a long-winded sort of a way, if you're going to use analog stuff, you've got to use really good analog stuff. Otherwise, don't worry. Mm -hmm. You know, just 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 concentrate on you know mastering in the box. Which actually, I have a friend who who I mean, I I don't. It, to me, it's no fun. But I have a friend who works on a lot of big time rap records. And he's in the box, and he can take his laptop up to Palm Springs and master a record on headphones. You know, <laughs> he can travel. He's not tied to a yeah, sure. heavy bunch of analog gear that can't go anywhere. He can actually do it on the road. Mm. Build in some work. You know, make some mm. changes. Maybe not like, maybe not master the whole thing. But if he needs to make some changes or something, he can. He's not stuck in one place. The big advantage, actually, of, of using analog stuff. So I think if you it, probably, and I don't know this because I don't do it myself. I mean, I, I'm sort of a hybrid. You know, I do use plugins, but I, I sometimes on the front end of the capture. But um, I imagine that if you spend enough time, you could probably get very close. I mean, I wouldn't say that you could. <clears throat> I wouldn't say you could copy. You could get the sound of like $8,000 for two channels of D to A. I mean, those boxes are special. You know, they cost a lot of money and it's like, basically, this is what we always say, isn't it? We're driving around in a 2004 Prius and <laughs> <laughs> we spend like, you know, which is worth about half as much as one mm -hmm. of the it's like it's kind of crazy spending that much money on it but there's something about that you know it sounds really interesting it has an interesting sound to it the analog circuitry in those things is very uh sort of i mean some you you know somebody like dan lavery is a brilliant guy and he spent a lot of time he spent many years as an old guy he spent a long many years thinking about that probably every day he thinks about it and he's made this thing. And, um, you know, those things are worth, those things are, are, are just priceless, really. You know, it's somebody's life's work. And they, they've just, you know, they're brilliant people. So it's very interesting to see what they, you know, it's very interesting to see what they come up with. Um, so, yeah, that my take on analog stuff is if it's, if you, Unfortunately, it's expensive, so you have to do. It's all a question of um, return on investment. You know, if you're going to buy an eight thousand dollar box, then you need to be able to make enough money to where that doesn't totally kill you. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. it's just it's, it's calculation. It's a business thing. Yeah, but you as know. we we can unless see, unless you're independently wealthy and you're you know then that's a different thing but absolutely so the whole chain is important so it's not only uh, about okay i'm going to buy some analog analog compressor or an eq or to color the sound but also the conversion does play a role in both worlds to uh, convert from the digital to the audio world and uh, back again so at the final stage and this yeah no, that's very that's important cool. actually hmm. To and also clocking mm -hmm. uh the the you know the 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 and that's the all right who's the master mm -hmm. you know you in a digital system you have to have a master clock mm -hmm. and it has to be a good master clock mm -hmm. and it makes a huge difference um you know i see people on mastering forums laughing about clocking and Oh, and the other thing that I forgot to mention is the cables that you use mm, to connect. This. Really, and okay. if you look at if you look at the Facebook mastering group that mm -hmm. I, I look at sometimes, it's, people are like, "A cable is just a cable; it doesn't make any difference." That is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
I came across, um, there's this Canadian chap who builds cables for me, who's, you know, super nerdy. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, they have a big effect on the sound. You know, they do. So it, So the analog system is the converters, the cables, the clocking of the D to A and A to D, and um, it's all of those things. It's a system, and then it, then it also takes um, it, it also takes a lot of time to understand how to get the best sound out of it, which is basically how hard you hit it. Like when we're going in, coming out, like the level. Mm-hmm. You pass through everything. And in fact, the order of the pieces that you use. Mm-hmm. Does the sample rate play a role in this when it comes to conversion and maybe delivering masters for multiple platforms like a digital release or a CD release? Okay, CD releases um, actually in uh, 44.1 and 16, of course, matching the Redbook standard. But I think when it yeah. comes to iTunes or Spotify, we can have a higher... Uh, bit values and bit depths. So, does it actually matter when it comes to mastering uh, and your conversion from one to the other world and back again that you have a certain sample rate uh, going on or asking for for the mixing engineer? Um, I don't really think it makes much difference, honestly. Mm-hmm. I think that if you get the sound, it's the sound. Mm-hmm. And then, actually, um, It's another area of disagreement that I have with most mastering engineers is everybody thinks that higher sample rates sound better. I don't know. I'm not so sure about that, actually. As a matter of fact, I think there are many things that sound better at 16-bit than 24-bit to me. It's kind of a, I don't know how to describe it. It's a different sound, but it's, it's appropriate for certain things. I actually learned that when I was working on with, this um, person who um, I did a lot of recording with Beyonce's mm. stuff mm-hmm. and they always use 16 bit and I asked him about it one day and he was like for this kind of music it actually sounds better okay interesting <laughs> <laughs> again you, you you basically need to listen to these things I think a higher sample rate um, is probably a good idea if you're recording classical music or you know, maybe acoustic music. When you really need the dynamic range yeah, to fill well, every I bit. Well, I think my feeling of it, yeah, dynamic range, but I think the thing that um, uh, the the sort of ambient information is conveyed better at higher sample rates, like the room. Mm-hmm. You know, now in, in most of the music that I work on is pop music, so there isn't really any room or mm-hmm. it's all just kind of created by plugins and so forth. So mm-hmm. I, I'm not a big proponent of um, high resolution stuff. I mostly send people stuff at 4416 mm-hmm. and because I figure that's going to work for them in a variety of situations if they're, mm-hmm. um, they don't know much about mm, what's going on. They can just play it and it's not going to go through some, you know, because people's computers are at 44.1 kilohertz, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, if you send them a 4896K file, what's happening there? Mm-hmm. There's some kind of sample rate conversion going on, some sort of low quality sample rate conversion. You know, so I, I don't know. I think you just try to make things easy for people, just make it sound good. Mm-hmm. Is uh, analog summing uh, a topic in your world? Um. Mm, You know, I've experimented with it, and I sort of, I I don't know. I think it's, uh, honestly, the summing is better in the box than it is through running it through various things. I mean, I I went through a phase, because I used to do quite a lot of mixing, Mm -hmm. and I went through all the summing things and listened to them. And I think the thing is, is that what most people do is that, you know, I came to the conclusion that you, okay, here's your mix of a song, so then you go, okay, I've mixed it in, it's in stereo and it's, you know, I'm in Pro Tools and here I am, it's coming out, you know, here's the stereo mix. Now I'm going to change the outputs to like 
eight channels or 16 channels, whatever it is. Then I'm going to play it through there, and then I'm going to print, play it through the summing thing, and then I'm going to print it, and I'm going to compare that to my thing, and then it sounds different, and then I'm going to decide which one I like. So there's a big problem with that is that you've been working all the way through the mix on in the box, say. Mm -hmm. So you get the sound that you want. If you had started out working through the summing thing, you would probably end up with the sound you want also. Would it be a little bit different? Yeah, but you, you can't tell by switching from one to the other. And it's mostly how people say, oh, yeah, it sounds much better if you put it through a console. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not. You know, maybe actually, you know. And I, I think the key to all these things is whatever you've got to work on, get to know it really well mm -hmm. because I mean, that's the Billie Eilish thing. Honestly, yeah. the first stuff that they did, they had really cheap equipment. Mm -hmm. The Billie Eilish album that was the first, you know, when the bedroom recording mm -hmm. just wiped everything out and won all those Grammys. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it worked is because they had a very limited sort of environment, mm -hmm. limited stuff. And they worked really, really hard, and they got to know it really well. They got to know, they got to get the sounds that they wanted out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's completely antithetical to um, the way that most people would say, "Oh, you need like a, you know, so you need like a AKG C12 on the vocal or something." Well, they. You know, the early stuff, they didn't even have preamps. I mean, they just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bedroom production yeah. in the end. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, you know, it, it's really a question of uh, being sort of inventive with with what you've got. Mm -hmm. And, and um, yeah, you know, get, get to know it really well, get to know its strengths and its weaknesses when it sounds good, when it doesn't. Sure. And that's kind of hard to, that's hard to, you know, takes a while. I think, takes yeah, I think Finney's and, and Billy Eilish, um, they both um, put, an, put an emphasis on uh, working on the vocals, as you can already hear it in the mixing stuff, as they are quite uh, wide and wide stereo feel, but you also have the main vocals in the center. Um, when it comes to mastering, um, did you think you, you you had to push maybe the low end a little bit more compared to other artists or maybe uh, to push um, the, the mids or the, the, the treble, the high frequencies uh, to get the work actually done? Was it really something special because it's all based on the vocals on these productions or did you just uh, recall your, your daily routine and okay, let's try this, let's try this and that's basically it? Um, well, I think, um, no, I, I think it was pretty much done when it was sent to, you know, sent to be mixed, honestly. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's changed much from what Phineas had, you yeah, know, and to when it came out. I, I don't think there's much, mm -hmm. as far as the low end goes and all that stuff. It's not a big, you know, nobody kind of radically did anything to it, mm -hmm. I don't think. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, um, the I use the transformers on the Elysia Alpha because they do kind of um, they do kind of sort of round out the low end a little bit. I don't know how to describe it, but it, it's kind of it's a little more of a delicate kind of a sound. I think. Um, so there is that, but then I did boost stuff as well, because that's one way of approaching stuff. It's like you, you know, that this the thing about um, music a lot of times is that like it is like okay, you get it, and you're like, oh, that vocal is like really bright, you know. Well, there's two ways of looking at that. You can try and sort of average everything out, and this applies to mixing as well as you, as I'm sure you know. It's like you can sort of. Um, if you're not careful, you end up with this perfectly manicured thing that nothing is sticking out and it's got no kind of life to it. So a lot of times with music, especially, 
you know, back in the 60s and 70s. I think people were basically really high when they worked on a lot of that music. <laughs> so, you know, you'd have stuff going on. The snare drum would be like super loud, you know, <laughs> and nobody noticed when they were doing it, you know, or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, but actually what makes it really cool mm -hmm. is that something is like really way off the chart, you know. It's not all kind of, you know, smoothed out and mm -hmm. sort of, you know, there's something kind of rough about it. So basically, um, I guess, you know, in 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 Billy's stuff, no, I, I didn't change the frequency balances really. I mean, the thing about that stuff is that, um, first of all, as I said, her voice, and second of all, um, Phineas is a really brilliant vocal arranger. Mm -hmm. And if you, the vocal arrangements on those songs are sort of next level. If you listen to them, like I, you know, because I got it, I printed all the stems. Mm -hmm. so I would listen to the, just the vocals by themselves. And there's stuff in there that most people wouldn't be able to figure out, really. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, that's, you know, if you're, if you want asking, I mean, first of all, it's the sound of the voice and it's her personality. But beyond that, it's just really interestingly yeah. put together. And that's what most people couldn't do that or can't do that. Don't know how to do that, whatever. I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. To get it sound yeah. like where it could be, especially if you compare well, the yeah. tracks well, on the, arran the, the arrangement, record. the vocal, the harmonies, the way yeah. that, you know, they're, you know, is all really interestingly done. So Absolutely. that's a big part of the. Yeah. Um, the attraction of it. Yeah, and there's there are many styles and flavors going on when you compare, let's say, bury a friend to uh, when the party's over. I think both on the same record, but totally different styles. And now, bury a friend. Yeah. Bury a friend. I have to tell you, um, since you're in Germany, mm -hmm. they when that album came out, I got this panicky letter from the uh, from Billy's manager saying the German radio stations say they can't play that song on the radio because there's too much bass on it. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of the so first things that I blasts, noticed there about this song. two blasts of low frequency <laughs> information when everything yeah. else drops out and there's two this thing. And the German yeah. radio people, and no one else anywhere else in the world, but they were like, there was some criteria they had that it didn't, they couldn't deal with it. So I think Phineas had to do a special edit of the song. I see. German radio. For us German radio stations in That's particular. Right. That's cool. Yes. There's a little fun fact on that because um, a colleague of mine here at Hofa, he uh, really got me into Billie Eilish as well when the record came out. And I didn't know about this girl. And uh, just listen to this. There's a track called Bury a Friend and watch the, the music uh, video. And I was wondering what's going on with the low end on this track. So it's kind of funny that you mentioned that the German radio stations in particular had some issues no, playing uh, that like song. <laughs> they, weren't, they, weren't, they didn't like it. They weren't going to help. I um, see. So maybe we're the, something uh, special. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other thing I think about that record was that I got a lot of, because people always think, as a mastering engineer, you always get the blame for everything. Sure. You know, it's like, because you're People the final one to be responsible yeah. for everything that's about to come. <laughs> yeah. So there was um, that song Zanny that has that big kind of mm. broken up bass thing, you know. That apparently came about because um, they were listening to it on a boombox and they just turned it all the way up. And it had that boombox. And Billy was like, yeah, that, I want it to sound like that. That's what I want it to sound like. Yeah. And so that's what it sounds like. Yeah. So. But they, everybody was like, it came out, everybody was like, the mastering engineer. <laughs> He's responsible. <laughs> was like, that's where I learned, actually. <clears throat> that uh -huh. was my, kind of, my little brush with fame. That's about as close as I ever want to get. Mm -hmm. was, I had haters. Mm. I actually had haters. You know, people would post stuff on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Facebook and things about how, you know, I was like, I did this and I did that. That's where I learned about that thing. So it, I can tell you, Simon, if you ever get into that position, mm -hmm. and there's like people saying stuff about your work, do not respond to any of it. Just let it go. Mm -hmm. Don't 
comment on it. Don't try and correct it. Mm. Losing battle. I see. Okay. Yeah. That's a good don't, advice. <laughs> yes, that's all right. That would be mm. my advice to anybody who's listening. Yeah. If you ever work on a big record and mm. people start saying stuff about your work, just don't respond. And I'll, I'll tell you, actually, Josh Goodwin told me that, who worked on Justin Bieber's stuff. Because I was telling him, I said, these people were saying like these things on Facebook. And he was like, he said, well, you didn't respond, did you? And I was like, <laughs> actually, yes, I did. Ah. He goes, never do that. And, that, <laughs> do and that. now there's no way out and you're finally, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Um, yeah, actually, when you start mastering and let's say you're working on a song and two hours had passed, and you uh, finally notice, oh, um, well, that's actually the wrong way. It just doesn't work. Does it still happen uh, these days that you have to maybe take a longer break and then um, restart the whole mastering process? Or is it something that you can deal with in some certain way? I think that if it takes you two hours to master a song, then you should not be doing it, yeah. you know. I, sure. I don't think that's... Because the, the thing about mastering, really, um, is that I think that um, the whole thing takes place in about, you know, a tenth of a second. When you put it up and you listen to it, uh, all of the, you know, how you want it to sound or what you think you can do to it takes place right away. And then the rest of it is just kind of trying to see if you can get there. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my feeling about it. Yeah, totally true. Yeah. I would second that in any regard. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about streaming platforms. As we've already heard something about it, that there are uh, multiple ones of them, of course. We have Spotify with iTunes uh, or Apple Music. Um, uh, does it play a major role in your world? Because um, you mentioned that uh, most of your masters are uh, typically converted in 44.1 and 16-bit. and um, But are there situations that uh, the artist or the label is asking you to have another version at, let's say, 48 or 24? Is it something you have oh, to deal with? Yeah, my most of the labels you send them 40 you send them 24 and 16 bit mm -hmm. um people that work in sync a lot with film and stuff mm -hmm. sometimes wanted at 48 sure. kilohertz um but that's most of it is 44 1 16 or 24. um as far as the streaming platforms i'm afraid i've sort of given up on mm -hmm. trying to figure out what is going on there honestly because um and i i know there are kind of there's a whole slew of kind of audio influencer people who kind of make these videos about how to mm -hmm. make stuff loud or not or whatever but honestly mm -hmm. i mean i i've had stuff that that you know is it's like really loud and it's louder than everything else on youtube and then something's not. And I, I don't think this, I think it's pretty hit and miss, honestly. I don't think you can really, um, I mean, I did, so I spent some time, <clears throat> well, first of all, yeah. So here's my, about two years ago, I spent, I made, a, I, I basically set up this thing where I got Spotify mm -hmm. um, and then recorded stuff just in the kind of regular analog input in my computer. With normalization turned off, mm. normalization turned on, um, and then recorded, like, got four or five songs and looked at all the waveforms and sort of, like, some of them were like this, some of them were like this, and it was like sort of, I mean, it, it, it levels, it, it actually, I mean, essentially Spotify, for example, mm. all they're trying to do is just average out the listening volume so that when you make a playlist, um, you don't get blown out of the water by some song that's much louder than another song. And I think that it does a pretty good job of that, honestly. You make a playlist and you're a person, you have it going on in your living room, and you're having dinner or something. It, it, it works pretty well. So that's really all it is. It's mm -hmm. just kind of we're just trying to make the listening experience mm -hmm. uh, 
smooth. It sounds pretty bad. Actually, the whole thing mm -hmm. sounds bad. It doesn't, it's not a good sounding delivery system. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know how would it be? It's like over the internet, you know. And I, I think ultimately <clears throat> when the internet gets, when, when everything gets, you know, when you start streaming wave files and stuff like that, maybe it won't matter. Mm -hmm. you know, it'll be kind of it'll be kind of like we went through all the stuff with MP3s. Mm -hmm. Or how do you make MP3 sound good? Why do you do this and that? Mm. And then all sort of like after a few years, the bandwidths increase and nobody cares anymore. Mm. So hopefully, Spotify, hopefully the streaming thing is like that. Um, <clears throat> but as far as, um, I mean, I had one experience. Uh, it, 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 you know, the whole thing is fundamentally really stupid, actually, because, you know, they're just average the song so if you have a song that is well like sani for example mm -hmm. um somebody did this like 15 minute video <clears throat> critiquing the mastering of it mm -hmm. and like, well, it was like sort of you know um but it turned out that that um it was only being turned down 2 db and the guy was like how is this possible because during this part the you know, the RMS value is zero. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> the RMS mm. is the, the peak, you know. Well, of course, that was my fault, but not really. But, um, but uh, you know, so how is it possible that it's only being turned down by 2 dB? Well, the answer is, is that there's some tiny little quiet parts in there. There's a lot of really quiet, quiet parts in there. So if you want your loud stuff to be loud, then in the arrangement of it, build in quiet sections, and then the average will be lower. So it basically the normalization punishes mm -hmm. things like pop that's go in with everybody playing and go all the way through with everybody playing. Mm -hmm. They get really punished by the algorithm. And then stuff like rap music is comes out pretty loud because there's just the bass, the LUFS thing doesn't really look at the bass that much. Mm -hmm. It's kind of focused on the vocal area, the mid range. So if you just have a lot of bass, you have a really sharp little snare drum and a vocal and a few keyboardy things, you get that's going to sound really loud on on the streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is like it depends on the type of music. Um, now, the indie thing, I did have this experience with this guy who contacted me, and it wasn't actually a song that I had worked on. He was very unhappy with the way this song sounded because it wasn't because it was not loud enough on Spotify. So what I, I actually, but but it was like the thing is, um, uh, yeah. So what I did is I I kind of just. I, he sent me the master, which is the guy who, who had mastered it, which is basically what I would have done, what he did. And But I turned it all down so it was about minus 12, actually, which is mm -hmm. maybe, you know, we think, the target volume of sometimes, anyway, unless you have the setting different on your thing. But um, And it came out much louder. In fact, it mm -hmm. worked. Um, and it sounded really good, but the thing was, uh, A, it wasn't very well recorded. The drums were kind of, you know, and it was not really a very good mix. Um, so the drums got really kind of squashed and mm. and that's the problem. The transients weren't mm -hmm. good in the mm. play. So I, I, you've sort of come to the conclusion when you work on music for many years that it's like in – descending in oh, oh, sorry descending in descending order of of importance it's like the artist mm -hmm. you know the instrument the preamp the recording but you know or in other words if you have good sounds then the whole thing won't be a problem mm -hmm. if you have good sounds and talented people then it won't be a problem Mm -hmm. It's only a problem if there's a problem mm -hmm. in one of those other areas. And then nothing's going to help it, really. Mm -hmm. It'll just sound 
kind of weak on Spotify and it'll sound weak everywhere. Sure. So, well, so maybe not on CD, you could blast it, you know, you could make it sound really loud and then <laughs> that might help a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> Compared to everything else, you know. Yeah, it might be better if you maybe have some stems uh, to work on to have some more options and possibilities. But I guess you usually focus on on stereo tracks that you yeah. Well, if you have receive. stems, then you're mixing it. Mm. And then you're going to be like, well, can you turn this up a bit? Can you this section of the vocal is too? Mm -hmm. Then you're mixing it. Sure. So then yeah. then you figure out how you're going to bill for that, basically. <laughs> So you does know. does that mean that you usually work on stereo mixes, or yeah. do you sometimes ask for stems as as well, if it makes it any better? Occasionally, okay. If I feel that somebody's working in an environment where they've got like oceans of bass that they couldn't hear, mm -hmm. because who would ever do that in a million years if they could hear it properly? Mm -hmm. For example. Um, in fact, some people sent me a song from Australia the other day that, mm -hmm. and the guy said, I think it has too much bass on it. He goes, because when you play it on a system that has a sub, there's a lot of bass. And I listened to it and it was like, <laughs> I, I basically got an FFT filter and cut mm -hmm. about 20 dB off of everything below 50 cycles. And sent it back to them and they loved it and it worked, you know. So mm -hmm. it's like, but you could, if there was other stuff that like, for example, that's low enough. So it's not really going to affect the vocal. I mean, if it's too much bass up higher, like a hundred or something, then you probably would, would, it would be a good idea to have stems because otherwise you're taking a hundred kilohertz, a hundred hertz out of the vocal and the guitars and all of the stuff. And that's not really going to be good. But if it's like down low enough, if the problem is like real subby thing, you can get rid of that, and it's not going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you could. I mean, you, you know, you could ask for stems. I mean, if you want to make your life complicated. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, listening to music, and maybe before or in between or after the actual mastering process, um, do you have? Uh, different speaker systems or do you also use headphones or your car no. or whatever or is it just uh, one uh, setup uh, of, of gear that works for your approach it's one set of one set of at the moment german speakers really is. yeah cool <laughs> threes i'm using the key threes uh -huh. uh, so you know i don't i, I it, you know i think if you use to, well, here's the thing. This a guy who's um, uh, a guy who's tuned rooms in LA for many years. He was like, he had the best take on it. He was like, um, he was like, you know, a man with one watch always knows what time it is. Mm. A man with two watches is never quite sure. <laughs> yeah. There's some <laughs> truth in these words. <laughs> I don't know. I think you just get confused if you. Mm. Oh, I don't know. If I listen to it on different speakers, I'm like, I, uh, you know, actually, yeah, I don't really know why. I'm, I'm not. I, I do that sometimes because I do have other speakers, but I'm not really sure why I'm doing it because. You know, I know. Well, the keys, for example, the reason I use those is because. They're actually quite similar to headphones, mm -hmm. which is what most people listen to stuff on these days. To me, that's what they sound like. So I think I think I can I think I can make I think I can use them and I can understand what it's going to sound like on the most important thing of all, mm -hmm. Instagram on the phone. Now, if I do some work and somebody posts the thing, I listen to it and it sounds really good on my iPhone mm -hmm. speaker, mm -hmm. then it's been it's a success because that's how most people are going to come across Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so I think that the monitoring that I have at the moment is kind of mm -hmm. I can hear that that it's going to work mm -hmm. in that environment. Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. 
Okay, very cool. So I think we're up for the last question of today, one from our chat. Um, um, actually, a funny one. <laughs> um, how do you get in touch with all the big stars? So is it sometimes the artists themselves that ask for, oh, I want this to be mastered by uh, John Greenham, or is it more uh, like the labels try to get in touch with you? Or is it like artists and, and bands um, that have done a lot of work with you and they are very loyal to your uh, work and what you deliver? Any experience regarding this? Um, so I think in general, um, you know, if, if we're talking about the career, your career of people having a career in mastering. Um, the, the sort of it, it well, there's, there's, there's two kind of ways that, well, there's actually many ways, but th there's people in the business that started like, um, you know, they, they sort of apprenticed with some famous guy or woman, and that gets you into the whole thing faster if, you, if you're talented enough because then you kind of see all the emails and you see who everyone is and all of that. If you are sort of working on your own, it just takes a long time to to build up. I mean, and that was my situation because I, I worked in San Francisco for many years. It wasn't, you know, there's not a lot of, I mean, there's Metallica, there's Green Day and there's Santana and that's about it, you know. Um, and they mostly work in LA anyway, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, um, so, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I have a manager as well, which most mastering people don't, but if you, but, but basically it's, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing. I don't, it, it just takes a long time and you have to be lucky. You have to kind of meet the right people and then people do get in touch with you, um, because they want a certain sound. Um, and, you know, labels, artists, I mean, everybody looks at like when it comes, you know, the record comes out, they look at, oh, who mastered it? You know, and it says like currently I'm, I'm, uh, doing some stuff with, um, Muramasa, who's, Muramasa is German, actually. He's a very talented producer. Um, and I've had inquiries from, from that. I mean, he's very he's very he's a clever guy i don't know you don't know who he is but he's you should check it out m-u-r-a-m-a-s-a mm -hmm. -A -A. mm -hmm. um we're doing an album of his right now mm -hmm. he had a um, song with asap rocky that has like millions of plays and he had like he has features from other artists so you just kind of get on Instagram and you tag them and then other people see and there's kind of like, you know, that's that's kind of one way. Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it. Um, artists do suggest that they want to work with you based on other stuff that you've done. Um, I'd say that actually probably most, most important is relationships with mixers, mm -hmm. actually. Producers are kind of like producers kind of hate mastering engineers actually for the most part. They don't want anybody doing anything to any of their stuff. You know, it's like so so producers honestly not so much. Uh mixers though, you kind of become friends with them, you get to know them, and you know, you kind of develop a uh you know, a working relationship. Mm -hmm. Um and so, and then, then, well, the other thing about it is, is that then that, you know, lasts for a while and then it's kind of like relationships in general, you know, then they go off with somebody else and then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens. Sure. Um, so that, but um, I, I think it's just overall the career path in mastering is that you just kind of keep doing it, even though financially it doesn't make any sense probably for many years. Um, you just keep doing it, and then eventually you know enough people to where you're always going to be doing something. Mm -hmm. But you have to have a large pool, you know, because some people you might not, they'll make a record every two years or something. Yeah. And they'll call you. 
uh, other people, you know, and then, and then, but there, yeah, then there are labels, there's, you know, the Interscope stuff, and they'll just kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you get stuff from them sometimes, and uh, managers, sometimes like smaller labels, um, sometimes you'll get into one of those, and they'll send you everything for a while. It's sort of a revolving door of stuff, you know, it's kind of like, and somehow or another you, you know, you, you just never have any kind of a life or go anywhere or we're just always working eventually. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful? I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Do something else. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, not really, it's not really a career. It, it, it's, it's just you and your friends. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, you know, this community, that's the great thing actually about Los Angeles is because when I got here, it's like a lot of places, well, I don't know, San Francisco, um, it's very kind of, um, uh, you know, cliquey. Everybody's got their own little thing that they do and then people don't really talk to each other mm. nice thing about LA is that everybody is like hey welcome you know have at it you know mm -hmm. best of luck everybody's bad, very yeah. everybody's very um it's very friendly it's a very mm. nice community of people mm -hmm. the music community here is very no, everybody's very helpful mm -hmm. you go around to other people's places and you hang out with them and and um so it's nice, you know, like that. Music people generally are, are the film thing, not so much. Film people are, are tend to be. It's much more competitive, I think. So that, those kind of the film parties are always a bit. They're not much fun. The audio people are great, though. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I think we're done for today. Actually. Um, you answered uh, a lot of the questions that I had on my list regarding uh, the loudness and the mastering mm -hmm. process, the typical chains and the artists as well. So, um, yeah, even by well, not like, knowing it, we went through all of them. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. I would like yeah. to just, as far as the loudness thing goes, I would like to just sort of clarify something. And that is that I'm not a very technical person. And... You know, there are people who probably you could interview to sort of counterbalance it. I'm, I'm I, because I, I'm sure there is a lot to sort of understanding how all these things work and all that. I just don't really. Uh, it's just not my thing. You know, I just go for like I just try to make it sound good. Um, but you know, there is there are people who sort of are, are very. Yeah, you know, have very deep knowledge of these things, and, and and I'm sure I could learn some things from them. Actually, I just kind of um just you know I wake up every day and I just got this stuff to do, and I do the best I can. You know, I don't really know a lot about it though, honestly. So I'm not really the person to talk to about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, I think okay. we're done for today. Thanks so much for your time. Um, that's the most amount of talking chat. I've done for like months. I think. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. So I'm glad that I'm the person who actually uh, made it happen and yeah, well, had, cool. the, well, had the pleasure to have you in this little yeah. series of our studio talks. And I hope you enjoyed yourself that much as I did. Yeah, it was fun. It was very nice. Thank you. Yeah. And we actually answered a lot of the questions from the chat as well. I tried to throw them in every now and then and yeah I, I hope it worked for everyone who uh, took part in this little chat session today and yeah if you people like what you uh, just saw um, yeah just feel free to visit us at Hofer College Hofer Studios Hofer Plugins Hofer Acoustic and so on um, yeah have a great evening in Germany all over the world okay so take a stiff upper lip all the best to you Goodbye for now. <laughs>